Welcome to Second Wind with Joyce Buford, a program for and about women. Joyce Buford is a certified coach and motivational speaker who has a passion for helping women who need a second win. She is the author of the Amazon bestseller, Effortless Happiness, How to Find Your Voice and Finally Ask for What You Really Want. She studied directly with her mentor, Jack Canfield, and is a fully certified coach in his program. Also, she has served as an assistant in his training programs. Through her study with many prestigious coaches and mentors, she has created a powerful program that has positively impacted thousands of people. On today's program, Joyce and her guests will help you to get your second wind. Now here's your host, Joyce Buford. Good morning. Welcome to Second Wind. You know, when I was going through my one of many second winds, back in the day is kind of the results is my book, which is Effortless Happiness. It was so eye-opening to me that I had so many values, so many talents that I just thought nothing of. And so when I did my, the learning process of how to reconnect with my values and my talents, it was absolutely eye-opening, life-changing because I had seen some of those values in a different light. They had been criticized. They had been torn down by my friends, my family, and it was really, really important for me to capture them, make them part of my life, and know they are what really makes me unique. So in a few weeks, I'm going to be offering a great opportunity so that you can learn your values and talents, and we're going to spend some time. So I think I want you to put that into your hat. It's coming. It's coming. But in the meantime, should you want to start earlier than having the one-on-one teaching, you can go to Amazon.com and pick up my book, Joyce Buford, Effortless Happiness. Now, today, we're going to be talking with a woman who is amazing. I actually like what she has done with her many years of experience. Her name is Heidi Burkhart, and she is the president and founder of Dane Real Estate. Now, Heidi uh, formed Dane, which is a real estate brokerage firm, affordable housing real estate brokerage firm, and she did this in 2008 when she was 26 years old. Dane is the only woman-owned and operated brokerage in New York City and a respected brand nationwide in affordable housing. Today, the company has facilitated closings in excess of 20,000 affordable housing units and over $2.5 billion in transactions. Dane has had tremendous success rehabilitating properties nationwide, but focusing heavily on the New York City area. Most notably, Heidi brokered one of the first preservation projects in the nation, utilizing Rental Assistance Demonstration Program. Heidi has used her business success as a platform for affordable housing and economic development. Wow, lady, that's all I could say. Wow. <laughs> I like it. It's a, it's a tongue twister <laughs> one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, this I'm a little shaky here because I'm going, are you kidding me? 26 years old? When did you yeah. start a real estate business? I started at 20. 20 years old so and literally the day before my 21st so I should admit but still I was I was very young but yeah but what gave you the courage to say I want to step up into this because I've had a little tinkering with real estate in my small city that I live in and uh you know it sometimes just throws the fear in me you know it's yeah, so learned 
Yeah, I think I will always contribute a lot of my like gumption and like gun ho and fearless nature just to being a the youngest child with parents that are fully supportive and yes. also my brother and sister, but then also just my tennis career. You know, when you played sports at a young age, being singles as well as doubles, meaning individual versus as well as team team sport aspect, I think it yeah. makes you really see things differently and makes you go um go a lot farther like my dad always had me playing 16 and 18 year old tournaments when I was only 10 and 12 so I think when you have that kind of situation going on just you build that kind of uh structure in your life to go after things Mm -hmm. a lot a lot more Mm -hmm. and so were you being naive and young and starting things is a lot easier than being 38 (laughs) now (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah. So, were you a winner in the tennis game? Yeah, my dad is in, like I was always mad if I lost, so I always had to win. So it was um, instilled in me to always get after it. I was a little brat back in the day in tennis, but it made me appreciate um, being more respectful later on, you know, with people. So I, I always laugh because the only thing that really brings out the bad side of me, as I call, like the little brat is tennis but everything else Mm -hmm. you know I always try to treat people like I want to be treated so right so challenges weren't um they didn't make you feel uncomfortable you were comfort comfortable with challenges right yeah I think you have to make sure especially as an entrepreneur you have to make sure you become comfortable you know I read you know when I started and when I still do I read a lot of books and I you know I don't do the um unfortunately I don't do the uh books, um, audio books, but I do read mm-hmm. a lot and I underline a lot. And, you know, when you read a lot of books, you kind of understand what that fearless nature is, especially like Robert Greene in the book Mastery. You know, he really does, you know, make sure you take emotions out of things on um, the best you can and just really look at the problem from above in order to solve yes. it. But constantly keep on going back down to the dance floor, take yourself out and keep on reassessing your situation um, without emotion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that makes you more fearless. You know, when you can yes. be successful and having the motion at the right time, it's also being okay to take them out and understanding, you know, everybody's point of view and not being judgmental on that, you know, and understanding that, you know, everybody has a different view. Everybody has brought up something different and came from something mm-hmm. different. And when you understand that and you put yourself in other people's shoes, it makes business a lot easier, um, a yes. lot more compassion, a lot more fair aspect. And, you know, when people feel that from you, They help support you to grow, and, you know, that makes you even more fearless because you have the support from a community versus just yourself. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot to be said in the mindset that we come up with. I mean, it limits it. It scares us. It it keeps us (laughs) from growing, you know, and I think all of us have to deal with it um, to one degree or not. And so, but it's definitely those people that have mastered it, that have sort of gotten their mindset into the right place, that have achieved the most. Um, and so, yeah, I can see. I um, had a nephew that played tennis, and um, he was always, maybe not to the degree, degree you did, but he played all over Texas. And um, he he was quite a, a self-made man. He felt very confident in in himself, and that was great to see. I don't know what yep. there is about that game of tennis. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little ball, just like golf. It's just a little ball, and you have to get in the right spots all the time. But it's also strategic, you know. You, you always have to keep your brain on when you're playing tennis. You can't really lose focus. And just like with any sport, you know, once you lose focus and uh, stare off to the side for a bit, you'll probably lose. You know, so same with life. If you keep focused right. and you keep on going at it, you're sure to win if you just yeah. keep working at it. So kind of share with us how you started when you started so young. Did you start in the real estate business with a, surely you did, firm, but did you have a mentor in that, that period so of your life? I, yeah, so I've always been in sales um, since I've been 16. And I guess Mm -hmm. since I've been born, because I'm the youngest, so I always try to sell my parents on buying new stuff too. But with that being said, um, (laughs) you know, I've always been in that mindset of, you know, compromise, settling, and, you know, trying to get people what they want, you know. So Mm -hmm. when I first got out of college um, at 18, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I got my master's and 
I started getting my master's and then found a job in pharmaceutical sales, which pulled me out to the East Coast. Um, mm-hmm. so I just really wanted to get out to one of the coasts versus staying in Toledo. And then I didn't realize how expensive um, Stanford, Connecticut was close to New York City. So I got a second mm-hmm. job to help pay for expenses um, at a retail store. So I did both of those at the same time just to make ends meet. Um, and mm-hmm. that's how I found my second job. The owner of the brokerage company actually came in and um, I have asked her for her number and if I could call her because she's just dropped like $3,000 down even thinking about it. And from Ohio, mm-hmm. you never would have saw that. Like that's just mm-hmm. insane. <laughs> So I wanted yeah. to get to know her. So mm-hmm. after I visited her, she rather interviewed me, and then she offered me a desk, which, again, brokerage, you don't make any salary. So when I look back on it, I'm like, oh, my God, what was I thinking? Because I went from making a decent salary to nothing. Um, they didn't give me a draw. They made me pay for my desk and my computer and my phone. So <gasps> it was kind of comical looking back at it. Yeah. So. Oh, um, my gosh. Know, my yeah. mentors were really not the people – at my company, it was more so my mentors were my clients. And I started really having them as my mentors. And, you know, as a result of them being my mentors, they really wanted to be six feet. So we started, they started giving me deals and doing deals like Ken Pagano, Larry Gluck, Charlie Gender, and Deborah Van Amarong, and Scott Jaffe, Lou Heinkind, um, you know, even Eugene Schnur of Omni related, you know, Mark Carbone, um, Steve Ross, you know, those individuals really, I kind of, towards them and even if they didn't respond to every email all it took was like a little piece of information that they would give me you know that you know everybody has an idea it's execution that's key you know those kind of things that always stick in my head that Mm -hmm. mentors would say to me or like Deborah Van Amarong and always says I choose happiness even though it's harder some days I choose (laughs) happiness every day so those kinds of things resonate you know when you're down and out so having those kinds of positive and, and successful and productive mentors has been key. You know, I still search mm-hmm. them out. I still, they're still family now to me, but, um, yeah, I think that's what it, it has set me apart, you know, and has given me such a good foundation. Um, and the other thing is affordable housing is such a tight knit community and such a very giving community. So it's, um, I'm, I'm lucky and blessed that I stumbled upon affordable housing for that reason. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about what, when you say affordable housing, what are you talking about? That's everybody's question. It means a lot. It's a lot of different definitions. <laughs> oh, you can't say it in five words? <laughs> no, I, can't. I would say the easiest way, the most things we've sold is project-based Section 8 properties. Um, so we deal with the properties as a whole. There is still some rent stabilized that we've sold, which is still affordable housing. There's also low-income housing tax credit properties that we've sold that are, again, a form of affordable housing. Um, we're working on some developments that are 70-30s, which is 70 market, 30% affordable housing. we sold homeless shelters. So there's a lot mm-hmm. of different definitions of affordable housing that people don't really realize. Um, and it's not mm-hmm. just the projects. It's a lot of beautiful properties with a lot of beautiful, smart, capable, amazing individuals that, and families that live there. So, you know, that's the one thing I love pressing is that people don't even know when they're passing affordable housing in places like New York and even just Mm -hmm. around the country. And the stigmatism towards it is so silly um, because it's such amazing individuals and people that live and reside there that um, it's one of the things I always try to press is like every, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know, to have a diversity in culture and what have you within um, housing in its own. So. Yeah. So affordable housing is not just, in my, you know, pardon me as I say this, it's not just government funding. It's correct. also in, privately funded, correct? It's, well, funded, a lot of it's government funded, but privately owned. A lot of it is privately owned, not government owned. Usually oh, okay. the government does own some projects such as our properties, such as like the NYCHA buildings in New York City. They are selling uh, quite a few mm-hmm. of them to uh, tax credit developers that will do a major rehab on the properties. Um, so people get a new home, essentially, and with a new home, you mm-hmm. get new life and new thoughts and new ways of uh, perceiving the world, which is amazing because, you know, it's always nice to have a fresh new start. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, the, uh, I would say I don't know what actually the ratio is, but there is a lot of privately owned parties that have made affordable housing their life. Ah, well, that's interesting. Because this is kind of my first uh, um, time to research or even look at that type of industry with real estate. Of course, I'm not in real estate, so 
makes a big difference. But um, <laughs> do you see the effects of families moving into uh, your housing, changing their changing their focus? Do you know what I mean? If you take a family that struggled, 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 and they they get to move into a a new space, a cleaner space, a nicer space with neighborhood and neighbors that can change their outlook in life. Do you see that in your places? What I have seen is even something more beautiful is, you know, we're the catalyst for a lot of large renovations for properties. As a broker, Mm -hmm. we're the ones that uncover the opportunities to then find the right buyer to take the properties on. So, for Mm -hmm. instance, there was some properties that needed a little bit more TLC um, that we were hired to market and sell. And when the new owner stepped in, they did it in place rehab. So all the tenants stayed in their units, and then they they just did a huge extensive rehabilitation to the property and giving them new new walls, new floors, new kitchens, new bathrooms, new mm-hmm. outside facilities, new facades, new roofs. And wow. the, the makeover is basically absolutely incredible. And even just with mm-hmm. the ground being redone completely and being luscious mm-hmm. and beautiful and, you know, life in the trees mm-hmm. and vegetation, that yes. in its own, you know, is a beautiful thing. And families just had, we did a ribbon cutting and the enthusiasm and the pride of their new house just exuded, you know, their, mm-hmm. their happiness for living there now and saying, Hey, I live at this pod, like this property was leaps and bounds different than when you toured it before, you know, hallways getting redone, lobbies getting redone. Mm-hmm. And that to me is everything. Because as I said before, when you have a new, new home, a new fresh start in a way is how you kind of think of when your house gets renovated and your mm-hmm. building gets renovated, it feels real good. And then you you <laughs> exude that into your life. And then your yes. life starts feeling real good if you weren't already feeling that. And it, it trickles, you know, and it trickles to the next person. Uh, so, you know, that's something that I have loved seeing with a lot of our properties that we've been the catalyst in regards to being involved in, uh, in regards to the sale and the rehabilitation. Yeah. Um, um I have done a little work with Crisis Center, and I've seen some of that work because I like to help women get new housing, you know, when they're... Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and I just love seeing their, being there when they cut the ribbon, you know, I've actually hammered, yeah. not a good hammer, but, um, but anyway, it's kind of fun to physically work on the project, but it was such a joy seeing their pride and that's exactly what you're talking about when yeah. you've experienced beautiful. that yeah seeing their, it's a beautiful yeah. thing now yeah, i love seeing people succeed i mean it's and succeed and just finding happiness for themselves you know it's um it's a tough world out there and if you keep on letting it it keeps on letting you get down so it's nice when you can finally learn how to pull yourself up and out and really mm-hmm. learn to love yourself it's um you know, as cheesy as that sounds for men and women, it, it, it changes your life dramatically once you can do that. So it's, yeah. uh, and starting with a home, whatever home means to you is everything. Right. Yeah. Now you do these properties all over the United States. Uh, is it yeah. limited to the United States? Um, I have never done, we went to Australia for a while for commercial real estate. I'm assuming, Mm -hmm. you know, we did hear a little bit of affordable housing over there, but never dived into it too much. We only really know of it in the contiguous, well, in all of the 50 states as well as Puerto Rico. Um, Yeah. So, you know, in in all of those um, areas, yes, I'm not sure on outside. You know, I've heard right. some things in Africa, um, but again, we're so busy here, it's hard for me to look elsewhere. But um, my goal yeah. is to try to see um, down the road to invest in some housing of some sort in areas of Africa that um, help preserve the animals out that way. No. I'm a huge animal fanatic, oh, um, yes. let alone ocean creatures. Um, yeah. So I, I'm huge in those areas that protect those animals um, for us. Mm-hmm. And for the world, for that matter. But I, other than that, mm-hmm. I don't really know. Um, I would think a lot of places would. But again, I we're so busy here in the states, and you know, eventually, hopefully, do some in Africa. But other than that, I haven't I haven't really looked at that actually, and, and probably will after this call. 
<laughs> good. <So> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, we're talking about a decision that you made. What is something that I ta- I like to share with my listener that all of the all of us go through huge transitions in our life and it's only when we face those transitions that we see real change real growth real shift in who we are and so you just experienced a major change in your life and I'd hope that you would share that with my listener out there that needs to hear it oh definitely I'm assuming you mean moving to North Carolina um, yeah unexpectedly so yeah when COVID hit I was already moving I already had been here about two weeks prior and it was debating when I was going to move down um but that obviously expedited that tremendously because I decided right then and there I'm going to move to North Carolina um so I still put out the question maybe it'll just be for two months so I just brought a few of my things thinking I was going to go back to New York um, but then I decided, no, I'm just going to stay in North Carolina. You know, it's, um, mm-hmm. I have my two dogs, which are my everything. And mm-hmm. the big, the big dog likes to lick everything in New York city. So with COVID, that was not a question of staying. <laughs> so yeah. I was like, I don't need panic attacks, but, um, <laughs> oh, well, I ended up getting them though, but I'm like, I don't need panic attacks with him licking everything. But when I first moved here, I, I had anxiety. I, yeah, you know, I only knew New York for 18 years and it was, it was rough and not knowing, um, I didn't have anybody here with me. I was alone. And so the, for mm-hmm. the first two months, I had huge panic attacks and I literally was convinced I had COVID. I went to, I called the EMS twice and the second time they're like, you're having just panic attacks and allergies. Please don't call us again. We're not your best friend. I was <laughs> like, got it. And so I found, I eventually found a doctor, which again, coming from New York, no one wanted to see me. So I felt like <gasps> such a lever, such an outcast, and I literally oh, had to drive yes. all the way to Raleigh, Durham, to get seen by a doctor at UNC, which, God bless her, Susan. So it was um, Dr. Susan. So it was it was really rough. But, you know, at the end of the day, I just knew I had to stay positive. You know, mm-hmm. having panic attacks and feeling like I couldn't breathe and my, my heart just, just heavy on my chest was, was yeah. miserable, to be quite honest with you. And not having someone with me to take care of me really was just eye opening and saying saying yeah. I don't want to say a swear word but I won't but I was just like crap, you know, this is <laughs> I don't want to stay like this. I need to get better. Yeah. The EMS basically told me to go back to my routine in New York but be a little stronger in my workout. So I actually started doing two workouts a day. I ran two miles in the morning and I would lift at night because um, they said get my like make sure I was breathing and my anxiety out and right. do not look at the screen so much. And I haven't I didn't even think about how much I didn't look at the screen in New York because I was always in the office, but I was always on calls. But when I got down here, I was just on my screen a lot too. So it was funny, like, it made me just step back a little bit, which made me more productive. I ended up, you know, being on calls again a lot more, talking to clients. I didn't do Zoom because I couldn't look at the screen, so I really had to get used to people not wanting to do Zoom with me, which is, is funny. I'm like, we used to do phone calls. Why do we have to see each other now? <laughs> like, I look like crap. <laughs> I'm not pretty right now. I just got done running my two miles in the morning. I really look sweaty. I really don't want to be seen. Um, so yeah, it was, it so, was tough, you know. It was definitely tough. I don't, what, I don't understand the screen. Why can't you be on the screen? What's the screen doing to you? The lights? The um, what? The, the light. Yeah, the light. So the light. Like screen time with um, TV screens, your phone screens, your computer screens, mm-hmm. something with the light that affects your brain. So I, I had to be, so even now I'm kind of cognizant if I, if I felt like I've been watching the stock market too long and, and on mm-hmm. emails and writing too much, then I have to make sure yeah. I get off just because those panic attacks, oh, they were, they were miserable. Yeah. Like one, oh. one, I actually thought I died. And so I was driving my car and I literally ran up to my freezer and put my head in it because I saw this movie, which didn't really help. But, um, <laughs> it, it got pretty bad. And I'm not a person to have, have anxiety or panic. Yeah. I didn't feel yeah. it really, to be honest. I felt like I was doing decently. But once like that sets in, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm all alone. Who's going to take care of my dogs? What about my company? What about my employees? And then, all that yeah. just adds on to the panic. And, um, so, you know, I think from that lesson to other, to your listeners, it's, you know, it's constantly staying on the route of it's okay. 
you're allowed to feel, you're allowed to have emotion, you can cry, mm-hmm. you can get mad, but just know that tomorrow, once you have it all out for the one day, you're going to be fine, you're going to find happiness, search for the happiness, find the positivity, find reasons to laugh. And I think the last yeah. part of finding reasons to laugh, it's huge. So, yeah. um, you know, I think in life, and especially in entrepreneurship, you have to keep on laughing because something always goes wrong in the day. There's some, always something that happens. There's always someone mm-hmm. that's going to have an attitude with you in a day. I promise you, you always have to <laughs> solve problems and people don't like um, self-reflection. They're always going to blame you before they blame yourself. So you just have to always, just, you know, laugh and just be like, okay, let's just look at this without emotion and really just mm-hmm. keep moving forward. Cause a yelling at someone's not going to resolve anything. It's going to be, going to make the situation worse. Um, you beating yourself yeah. up. It's only going to make you feel worse. So that's not going to work either. So it's really just knowing, A, you're going to be fine, and B, find a reason to laugh. Yeah. Those are two very good words of encouragement. But, you know, you said something that I think we overlook a lot is that it's really getting out and moving our bodies, which I tend not to do very much of, that is so important (laughs) to help the attitude. I mean, just to get those endorphins and the little happy guys moving in our bodies. And it it's just amazing because I have started in a new routine thanks to COVID-19. Um, (laughs) because, you know, it was, I was getting depressed. Yeah. Because although I was not like your situation you could have been in, in New York, I have a friend up there and she hasn't been out of her apartment since March and she's downtown New York. City, yeah. downtown city. And, um, you know, she says to me, I just, I'd never go out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'd be so depressed. Yeah. And, um, she can't walk. She walks now to her office. Uh, but she says, it's like I'm in a ghost town. And I, and it's, that's gotta be fear there going on. Yeah. So there's a lot of it. But I do want to come back and visit this more when we get back, but we have to take a short break so we can give some credits to these people that have supported this uh, podcast. But all sorts of transitions, we're all going through so many transitions right now that have changed our life, but we know the basics of how to get us centered again, and that's what we need to keep remembering. And just as Heidi has shared some of those in her transition to North Carolina, we're faced no matter where we are with some of those limiting beliefs. So when we come back, we're going to visit some more of those. And... Heidi and I will discuss about fun things. So come back. Transformational coach, motivational speaker, and author Joyce Buford returns after this short break. Close your eyes and imagine living your life without limits. Where would you go? Who would you meet? What would you do? During an Uncover Your Hidden Genius session, you will discover what's keeping you from living your life with purpose, passion, and fulfillment of your potential. You'll get a clear vision of the steps you need to take to uncover your hidden genius so that you can live a life without limits. Sessions can be done over the phone, Skype, or in person. Find out more at www.JoyceBufordEmpowers.com or by calling 903-287-0747. It's words you never heard. It's summertime and you know what that means. Attack of the Mosquitoes. Other names for the mosquito are Galley Nipper, Katie Nipper, Gabber Napper, and Gelly Whopper. A quote from the 1906 book The Parsons Boys asserts that Galley Nippers are so called because at each nip they took a gallon. Mitzi is a deceptively cute shortening of mosquito that might be heard in Ohio. 
If you're in Virginia and hear someone complaining about cousins, they might have annoying relatives, or they might just be talking about mosquitoes. Why do they call mosquitoes cousins? Because there are so many and they stick so close. But whatever you call them, all this begs the question: Why didn't Noah swap those two mosquitoes? It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. Welcome back to this segment of Second Win. Joyce Buford, the author of Effortless Happiness, continues in this segment to share insights that will help you live a life of greater purpose and filled with happiness. Now here's our host, author and coach, Joyce Buford. Welcome back. We are talking with Heidi Burkhart, and she has just made a huge transition in her life. Now, she has been in real estate um affordable housing real estate for since 26 and I think she's still pretty young but anyway, <laughs> <aren't> you, <Heidi? laughs> uh, but anyway we've been talking about some great things just the importance of re- rebalancing yourself once you go through a major transition but I'm I would like to interview Heidi in about six months maybe when she's totally nestled and totally set up into her new environment, which is now in North Carolina. So, Heidi, where are you in North Carolina? I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina, or Wrightsville Beach. So I have a little beach condo that I've owned for about seven years now in Wrightsville Beach, and then I just bought a house in Wilmington, North Carolina. (sighs) I've been to, where is it? It's up in the mountains, North Carolina. Like Asheville? Asheville, yes. Yes, I used to work with a coach there, and that's a beautiful place. Really lovely. Very beautiful out that way. But you're on the beach. Yeah, I'm on the beach. I'm in the the water. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, you made the transition. You went out there since we're in the middle of COVID now. And, uh, oh, middle? Do I want to say that? Uh I wouldn't it be nice to say the end of COVID, but yeah, um, so amazing. I think it's a little early, but anyway. And you made the decision while you were out there to make a major life move. Um, you, you pointed out earlier about the the changes that you had to go through, um, and sometimes we don't realize that relocation can be so unsettling. Were you surprised by that? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's, I, I thought I was going to be going back to New York city. You know, I've been, I was, I've been in affordable housing broker since I was 20 and now I'm 18. So it's been 18 years and it's, um, it is my life, you know, New York city, it, it's so hard to leave. New York is just New York. It's a lovely, beautiful, diverse culture, uh, city, um, that's always on the go. And I love that energy, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to work. But, yeah. you know, one of my friends, Maria, Maria Mon actually had mentioned to me when she moved out a few years back, she's like, well, if you move out from New York City, you need to find a place that's very, um, visually stimulating and outside, outdoorsy. Cause you'll find ah. things to do outdoorsy to stay active. And she was right. So I've always, I always thought about that, even like here, I was, when I was like, can I do this? Um, you know, Wilmington has been beautiful in the sense that you can surf, you can, I don't fish, but you can go fishing, you can stand a paddle board, you can kayak, um, you mm. can play tennis, you can play golf, and there's just so much to do on a, on a beach little town. Um, it's yes. not too big. So it's a nice, as, as one of my friends Joe mentioned just today, he's like, it's a nice base camp. And so, as a lot of my friends have been saying, I can always go back to New York, which is something that helps me cope with it because I, I miss New York tremendously. Um, mm-hmm. But it's been nice to know that, you know, A, yeah, it is an awesome base camp. My sister moved up here because she loved it so much after visiting me in March, or uh, not March, May. So, it's mm-hmm. nice to have her whole family here, my nieces and nephews. And oh, her, my. Um, yeah, so, and also just knowing that I still can travel, I still will travel because that's really where my my home is, my heart is. Um, and, and it is a great base camp. I love being on the water. It gives me, um, sanity 
you know, mm-hmm. especially leaving New York. But it, it definitely was hard. You know, it definitely was unsettling. It's always a question, did I do the right move? Because I lost a lot moving here. Um, I can't get into a lot of it because I will get emotional. But I did lose a lot coming out here and risked a lot. Um, but, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, for myself, I really needed this because I have to stay positive for myself and my team. And being in New York cooped up right. in my condo and my apartment was not going to make me positive. So for my team's right. sake, um, I really needed to stay out here and stay down here so at least I could be positive because they they started getting down, you know, being mm. stuck in their apartments constantly. And I wanted to make sure I stay that ray of light like I like to do for them, even though I'm stern some days. But for most mm-hmm. days, I do like to laugh a lot. I do like to joke around a lot. And I needed to stay that, that leader for them so that they at least had a positive light coming and seeing things stay productive and things still getting made. So, you know, knowing those positive sides um, for, you know, coming out here um, have been, I I would not not trade this decision at all. You know, it it definitely was hard at first, but it's, you know, any risk, any risk is very hard. You know, you have to weigh it out a little bit um, and assess, but at the end of the day, you know, you really have to know you're going to be okay. And worst case, if it didn't work out, I can always go back, you know, and that, that makes me feel good. I think you said something really important that most of us think it's a do or die. It's black or white. And it's really not a black and white decision. As long as we have the mindset, we can go wherever we want to go. It's just a matter of not allowing ourselves to get stuck in one place. And also finding the positives with it all. I mean, it's hard not seeing my office every day because I've been with some of the ladies, Yachty in my office I've been with since, for 18 years. Oh, so not yeah. to see her and the, or Ricky during the day, it's, it, it, it's not fun for me because I do enjoy being around them. Um, right. But, you know, not having to worry about the expenses of paying for four walls in New York City, which was astronomical monthly rent. It's Mm -hmm. beautiful to me. It makes me so, like, the whole weight is (laughs) off my shoulders once that's done end of August. I can't freaking wait. So, Mm -hmm. like, that kind of stuff is the positive of it all, you know. So it's also making sure that you constantly remind yourself of the positive. Again, I lost a lot, a lot moving out here, and it it still breaks my heart. But um, it's one of those things I take day by day and just knowing that ultimately it was the best decision I could make at the time. With right. um, with everything that I have, so I mean, my now, dogs are definitely happy here. <laughs> now, is your business uh, still the the company itself is still located in the New York area? Our headquarters will be in North Carolina, but we will have a satellite office in New York. So, being that we will have oh. um, some of the employees still working remote from New York, um, but we will be changing our headquarters down here in North Carolina. Oh, you're moving everything. Yeah. 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 Well, they'll all be singing your praises eventually. If they're not now. (laughs) Uh, They like the remote style of work. You know, those, I'll eventually get them a WeWork, but I, I kind of want to see how COVID shakes everything out because there's so many unknowns right now. And it's not wise to do big decisions on big, like leases, um, when there's such huge unknowns as it is for New York right now. Yeah, for sure. Now, you mentioned that you love to travel. So what does that look like? What is your travel? International What or local or what? Definitely international. Yeah, definitely international. So I used to travel basically every three months to rejuvenate uh, myself. I would work. I really only worked and worked out and drank wine every now and again and walked my dogs. I called the four W's. So that's typically my routine in my life. Um, so I yeah. work really hard for travel. So, I, uh-huh. you know, I've done a lot of shark diving. I do a lot of scuba diving. I just went to um, Africa for my first time to see the gorillas as well as safari. Oh, um, which what will not be my last time many. there. Yeah. So I it's do a lot of crazy bad. travel. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get to touch the, the gorillas? No, you can't touch them, but they got really close. I mean, you're going to their natural habitat. You're hiking up. The, the mountains yes. in Rwanda, and it's um, it's such a life changing experience. I mean, there's only 200 gorillas, I think, at this point, which is actually a lot more than there was, and what? it's not enough. I mean, though, I I pray they never go extinct. A lot of my photography that I'll be actually selling 
um, as fine art is going to be geared towards the gorillas and putting the money back towards the gorillas. Um, a large portion oh, of that profit will go great. there because they, they affected me that much. And it's, um, yeah. you know, when you see such a beautiful creature that we're very similar to, you know, on, mm. on the face of extinction and it's not even, they can't do anything about it because, you know, of human nature, which is horrible. Um, mm-hmm. It's really sad. I mean, they're just such awesome, awesome creatures that yeah. it warms my heart seeing them. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to sleep with them. You know, it's like <laughs> 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 I hope I was hoping one of them would hug me, but I got in trouble when one got close to me. They're like, no, 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 got to back up. And I'm like, no, but I want the baby to come to me. Come to me. <laughs> he come wants to me. Come. He wants me. Now you. Now, I believe the woman, who is the woman that has done so much work over there with the gorillas? Uh, Diane Fossey. Uh, were you with yeah. her? Did you get to see her compound? or We did this... not see her compound. I know like Ellen DeGeneres actually did a lot of money that she's building um, with them on an educational um, school, mm-hmm. actually, which is amazing mm-hmm. to see that I would love to be a part of eventually. Um, yeah. But, no, I did not see her compound. We stayed at a... Be, you know, resort, which is actually um, mm-hmm. a hotel that gives them profits back to the community, which I love. It's a very, mm-hmm. it is high end, but I like the fact that a lot of the money went back to the community because um, mm-hmm. they, you know, they're the reason the gorillas are still alive, you know, the, yes. because they, they thrive on the tourism dollars and they, obviously it, it, they work for each other. But um, it, it's a, yeah, so I didn't get to see her facility, but Rwanda itself is just such a beautiful country. It's beautiful people and I learned mm-hmm. a lot, and I can't wait to go back to be among the people in the communities again, and, and of course the gorillas, let alone Kenya, right. but in right. Tanzania. So. I, I, with all this COVID that's gone on and how it's impacted the entire world, um, it concerns me so much in you know in different ways. I'm concerned about the education of our children. I'm concerned about people that don't have work. And in countries such as Africa and the um, other countries, they're so dependent upon travelers. And yep. I, I worry about their existence. Um, you know, there's just so many people. We are we don't think we are, but we are so intertwined with the rest of the world and in that we support so many things, good things that are going on. And um, I'm, I, it just kind of concerns me. I know it's going to work out. It's going to be, it's going to be the best. It's going to come back I mean, in whatever form it looks like. It won't be like what we remember, but yeah, it'll I be say, there. You know. I mean, to me, if you know of any countries that are heavy on tourism and to your listeners, I mean, when you give, you you get so much more in return, you know. So why I say that is if you just give $10 to uh, Rwanda, the Spino Resort, $10 feeds the family for a week over there, which their famine is huge right now in tourism spots that aren't as well off as, as Americans. So mm-hmm. if you actually look at, like, some, some areas that are rather deep, deep because of COVID where famine has truly hit, um, you know, even just $10 goes a long way. So, you know, Sabino at Mountain Gorilla Resort, I forget the whole name of it, but they, they only needed $10 for to feed a family for a week, which is like no brainer. You know, I will be yeah. happy. And, and to know that I helped feed a family for a week makes me feel really good. You know, me right. giving four to people makes me feel really good. So, you know, as much as the whole world is hit, and as you said, we're all intertwined, I think it's very important for us to remember that like, in your own happiness, when you can give to others, it actually will get those endorphins out and make you feel better too. And the more you give, mm-hmm. the more you get, and the more you grow. So I think that's important to realize, again, how we are all intertwined, like you mentioned, and, you know, we can all do something about it. Yeah. Good good information, good advice there for us to realize that. So, uh, so you're moving today. Bless her heart. She... <laughs> had the moving trucks there today. <laughs> so yeah, I had five. I have so much stuff from the, from New York. <laughs> I have an office. I have my apartment. And I had a condo I haven't seen for 10 years because I never thought I was – that's a whole other story. So I have <laughs> – 
so much stuff. I can't believe I had five trucks. And I'm like, where is this all going? <laughs> I know. You may yeah. be renting some storerooms. <laughs> yeah, I'll be selling hopefully a lot is my goal. So, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. crazy. So, as you see your life reorganizing, what what do you think? How do you think your life Oh, this is a tough one. I'm not sure you have a crystal ball, but <clears throat> how do you see your life changing from what it was in New York? Oh, a personal level, huge. Um, some good things, some bad things. Um, the one thing with New York is it's very transient in New York. So it was always hard for me to get a core group of girlfriends that stayed. A lot of my girlfriends have left. Um, or had lots and started families. Um, so I think on a personal level, I'll actually be in a city where I can have concrete friends that won't be so transient. And I've actually had more friends visit me here already than um, <laughs> when I was in New York, which is yeah. a beautiful thing. Um, <laughs> I will say, you know, um, on a work level, it's, I, I see it staying the same. I think I'll have less expenses, which will relieve me and I can start building more wealth, which building yes. wealth is huge on my mind right now. And I'm annoyed that I paid so much in rent all these years, but I'm happy COVID happened because it made me realize my office is very capable and very smart to work remotely. Um, yes. I'm excited to see what we're able to, to do as a remote office versus having to be in four walls. Um, it's great to see my assistant, Ricky, thinking about moving to bigger space to enjoy, you know, having more space for her house versus staying mm-hmm. in Brooklyn. Um, so that mm. makes me excited for her, you know, as a next step in life too, um, as well as the rest of my employees. You know, New York is a very tough city. You know, could have we stayed there? Yeah. But is it less stressful being out of it? Completely. Do I miss it? Absolutely. Do I love the culture and the smart and diversity? Every freaking day I will miss that. But that's where I'll be excited to go back. So I think when I go back for business too, I'll be setting up a lot more meetings, a lot more face-to-face versus when I was mm. living there, I took that for granted. So I think there's a lot of plus, a lot of positives that will come across, um, even though I did, again, lose a lot leaving. But at the end of the day, I will be gaining a lot more. So Yeah. How do you think we're going to address the culture of, of missing that we have in New York? I mean, even I consider in Tyler, Texas, I consider the culture city to be New York. I mean, it's the theater is there. Um, the museums are awesome. You have so many resources of that kind that really I find it kind of lacking in other parts. Maybe Chicago might have a bit of it. LA might have a bit of it, but, uh, what do you think about that culture thing? Well, I'm hoping, I mean, two things is I think that, A, we're still such a young country, right? We're still such a young country with immigration and filtering through the rest of the U.S. and not being so just one culture. So, mm-hmm. you know, here in Wilmington, I've been here for 12 years um, coming here, and to see the influx of uh, Hispanic and Latino um, cultures here, as well as Asian. Mm-hmm. Um, Twelve years ago, mm-hmm. you never really would see it. Now you see such an influx of that. Um, so you obviously have a lot of African American and Caucasian, um, but you never really saw the other side of the culture. So I think over time, America is definitely going to have more of an influx of culture across the board. Um, yes. Especially now that so many are being pushed out of New York. I think New York, um, it depends on who the next mayor is, if New York rebounds nicely because de Blasio's last year is next year, um, which is going to mm-hmm. be a very interesting year to say the least. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, at the end of the day, you know, New York will always rebound. New Yorkers always feel like we're always a New Yorker forever and we always want to mm-hmm. see it come out. Um, but I think, again, I think a lot of it's going to be a, who is the next mayor and how are they going to bring about and build back up New York? Cause this is going to change office strategy. This is going to change, you know, we, I will say we were dumb not to have Amazon there. Amazon, as I said in previous articles, when we, a long time ago when we, when the state and city said, no, we're not, we don't want Amazon here because they're getting too much tax breaks. Look who's actually surviving, surviving the recession. Amazon, mm. 
tech. Mm -hmm. If Amazon came here, we would have had tech and also vocational schooling. So I think, again, that's another whole other podcast, which I love vocational schooling. I think it gets a whole horrible stigmatism towards it, which they are so beyond needed and pay very well. So I think people need to rethink that. But um, culturally, I think think the rest of the U.S. is going to start seeing more influx. And I, I hope that's I hope we do. I hope that people get pushed out and looking at other places to live where they feel comfortable and supported. Um, you know, and I hope that there's more unity, you know, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. and I think there will be more unity, obviously, um, politics aside, you know, at the end of the day, everybody wants the best for the country. And so we have the common goal. We have the common goal that we all want the best for the world. So at least we have that, you know, that we do share. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, as we're coming close to the end of the hour, um, how would you like for people to be able to contact you or get to know a little bit more about you? What would you Definitely. like to? Sh- I would say Instagram um, at, at Miss Heidi Burkhart, which is M S Heidi H E I D I Burkhart B U R K H A R T, is the best way. I try not to be too much on um, social media, but I am on Facebook too at Heidi Burkhart. Uh, Twitter, same as Instagram. But other than that, you know, you can always reach out, DM me there, and I'll get back to you. I usually get back to everybody that does direct message me on any of those platforms. Um, so I love mentoring people. I love being there and help helping with advice, at least, you know, from my experience and my pitfalls and also my successes. A lot of pitfalls. I've learned a lot. So um, I'm mm-hmm. more than happy for people to reach out, follow me, whatever you want to do. Again, I'm here. And the only reason I, I am on social is, you know, for people to reach out, for me to offer my my advice and what happened to me and my troubles. So um, I look forward to anybody that has any questions for me. So when you say advice, tell me what you, what topics you're you're advising on. I is I it usually real tell estate or what I did wrong <laughs> in real estate or in life? Real estate and entrepreneurship. So okay. I would say in real estate and entrepreneurship and brokerage specifically, obviously, is a key area. But those three things, obviously, if someone has travel questions, I, I will talk travel, music, photography all day long. Um, <laughs> but I'm happy also to talk about the other topics that are my life being affordable housing and real estate and dogs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, traveling, I would go with you to see the gorillas, but I'm no good underwater. I can't breathe. So I, I can't it. go I with you. <laughs> I do want to go shark. see you don't the want to do the shark. You don't want to do the shark? Uh, no, I don't think so. I'm not comfortable in water. I uh, interviewed a, a friend of mine who does tours down in Panama with the whales and the dolphins. Oh, I love that. And she is at an, she has an awesome, uh, travel group down there, which that's definitely on my list. So people, if you've not started your travel list, you need to start one because you know, the, the day's going to come when we will be able to expand outside of our areas and, and see, I was trying to go to Santa Fe because I've been sort of, I just lost my, my dear dog last week and uh because she was so old I was kind of here with her and so um now that she's passed um I'm like okay now I can go someplace and I'm like Aww. I can't go anywhere <laughs> so. yeah I can't go anywhere right now it's so hard it's so bad it's so I'm tough. at least trying to get to Santa Fe so I could drive yeah. there so anyway, but it is interesting how we have to what not being able to go and do is such a new experience for us. Yeah, for definitely. not just us, but everybody. But for those that love to move, some people don't. They're quite happy staying in their environment. But those that do love to travel and explore and see what's happening on the other side. Um, it's kind of a new way of living. Yeah. Right? Definitely. Yeah. Tra- you need to travel. It's, uh, it humbles you very, very fast, and it's a good humbling experience, my personal feeling. So definitely. Yeah. Yeah. 
For sure. Um, I just want to thank you so much for being here with us today. I know it was uh, with the movers there, it was not the most convenient day, <laughs> but I, uh, I really do appreciate that you've been able to share the insights of your transition, the, the things that people need to think about and yet not be afraid of the transition because I have found that there is always greater benefits on the other side. It looks different, but it can be more full of, full of more joy, more happiness, but in a different way. And as yeah. Heidi has shared with us, the movie, we are so mobile now. We're able to take it with us in so many places. Or maybe for you, it's like finding a new, new job. It could be that. But I encourage you, like Heidi, to keep that door open. So, Heidi, thank you very much for giving us your time today. No, thank you so much. I know it was so beneficial to that special woman that needed to hear. Um, maybe she's facing the exact same thing that you went through. So, remember, you can touch, reach out to Heidi uh, with your questions about real estate or your transition. So thank you, Heidi, for being with us today. Thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing from people. So and your listeners. Yes, I hope they will reach out to you. So thank you for being here today. I look forward to this week because there's something new we're all going to learn this week. What will it be for you? Maybe it will be a new exercise program. Maybe it will be reaching out to somebody that really needs your support. Maybe it will be learning something new, picking up a book. There are so much, so many options that we have to not only change us, but help to help others change and move forward in their lives. I thank you for being here today. And I wish you the best week of the year that's coming forward today. Thank you. Until next week, I'll wish you the best. Joyce Buford returns next week at the same time for another edition of Second Wind. Through the Joyce Buford Empowerment System, women are receiving the support they need through their transitions and are able to reclaim their true purpose with confidence. They receive the tools they need to map out new lives. You can find out more about her coaching services at JoyceBufordEmpowers.com.